Hi guys, and welcome back to Let's Make a Redstone Computer. In the previous episode, we created the ALU, a device to perform operations on numbers. Today, we're gonna dive into the world of memory and build a fully working dual read register file. I hope you enjoy. But first, let's get more specific about which ALU design we're gonna use. In the last episode, I showed you three main designs for an ALU. A simple design where you just allow one output at a time and a more complicated design with two versions. This one is for a ripple carry adder and this one is for a carry cancel adder. For our computer, we're going to use this last one, the carry cancel ladder design. I like this one the best because the inputs are vertical and it's pretty small. Going to a diagram form, this is our computer so far. All we have is the ALU. D1 and D2 are the two 8-bit inputs, which I referred to as A and B in the last episode. The setting input is one of these 11 operations that our ALU can do, and the output is the 8-bit result. Remember, this is a combinational component, because once you put in the inputs, the output is already predetermined. You could even make a truth table with every possible combination, but it would be thousands of lines long. So an ALU can definitely do a lot on its own, but it's still pretty limited. The only expressions it can evaluate are ones that have two numbers, like 5 plus 6 or 2x or 3. What if you wanted to evaluate an expression with more than two numbers, like 1 plus 4 plus 7 for example? Well, even though you can't do it in one step, you can still do it, right? Just add 1 plus 4, which gives 5, and then add that 5 to 7, which gives 12. You only operated on two numbers at a time, but since you remembered the 5 and brought it back, you could still finish the evaluation. Using this same technique, you could evaluate an expression of any size, as long as you had enough memory to store the intermediate results. So let's start building some memory with redstone, because it seems like it would be kind of useful. In LRR number 7, I showed you guys that repeater locks are a great way to make memory, because they act as a natural data latch. All you have to do to write a bit is unlock it and relock it. To write a 1, just put a 1 behind it, and unlock, relock. Or to write a 0, it's the same idea. Using a stone button like this works fine, but it's actually a lot longer than it needs to be. You only need a minimum of a 2 tick pulse, which you can get from a 2 tick pulse generator. This gives just enough time to write the new data. One repeater lock only stores a single bit though, so how would you store more information? The easiest solution is to just use more of them. Here I have four repeater locks all hooked up to the same write line. So you can put in any number, like 0101, press write, and the whole thing gets written. This is called a register. A register just stores a number, and it's usually made with a bunch of data latches. Specifically, this is a 4-bit register, because you can store any 4-bit number to it. And although making horizontal registers works fine, in my opinion, it's more elegant to do it vertically. This is an 8-bit register with all 8 repeater locks stacked directly on top of each other. I say this is more elegant because now the right line is just one glass tower that reaches all 8 at once. So you can put in any 8-bit number and write it. If you want to write a new number, then you can just put it back here and write again. Now let's take this even further and combine multiple registers together. Here I took four registers and combined all the inputs into one main input right here. So if you put in a number, it gets duplicated to all of them. Then you can just press write on the register you want to write to. For example, to write a 5 to the second register, just put a 5 here, go to the second register, and press write. As you can see, it received a 5. The only downside with this circuit is that you can't write to multiple registers at once. But in our case, that's okay. Remember, the overall job of the computer is to execute simple instructions, so it's actually going to be better to write to one register at a time. Next, let's give these registers some official names, because calling them by the second one or the third one is kind of annoying. I'll call this one on the left register 0, then register 1, register 2, and register 3. And now that each one has a number, we can use a decoder from LRR number 6 to address them. This is a 2 to 4 decoder, meaning it takes in a 2-bit binary number, 0, 1, 2, or 3, and turns on the corresponding output. If you put in 1, it decodes to 1, or if you put in 2, it decodes to 2. A decoder outputs a constant signal though, so if you just hook this up to the right lines, it makes the selected register constantly open. Notice how if you put a 3 into this decoder, it comes over here, gets decoded for, and keeps register 3 completely unlocked. It would be really nice if, instead of this, we could wait for a button press to write to the register that we put in the decoder. One way to do this is to just cancel the input until the button is pressed. So now when you press write, the address gets released for two ticks, and you get the output for two ticks. For example, if you put in a 1 and press write, you get a two tick pulse on 1. Or if you put in a 3 and press write, you get a two tick pulse on 3. But as you might have noticed already, there's a subtle problem with this. Canceling the address is the same thing as setting the address to 0. 
but zero is a perfectly valid address, so the decoder is just going to constantly output zero while it's cancelled. Furthermore, since the decoder decodes for all possible combinations, there's no address we can put in to make it output nothing. To solve this problem, there are a few different approaches, and we're going to choose the most naive one. We're just going to remove register 0. So instead of registers 0, 1, 2, and 3, we'll just have 1, 2, and 3. And now, all of them are off by default until we choose 1, 2, or 3 and press right. Let's go ahead and hook this up and try it out. I'll put in a 4, select register 1, and press right. Then I'll put in a 5, select register 2, and press right again. And it worked. Register 1 got a 4, and register 2 got a 5. Okay, now that we can write to a specific address, it would make sense to read a specific address as well. To do this, I'm going to wire all the outputs together and put in another decoder to only allow one of them at a time. So when you put an address here, only that register's output will be allowed, and it'll show up on this output. I just filled the registers with these numbers, so let's try reading them. Reading 3 gives 6, reading 2 gives 5, and reading 1 gives 4. But what about address 0? What happens if you try to read that? Well, it looks like it outputs 0, because it decodes to nothing. We removed the physical copy of register 0. However, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Register 0 actually does exist if you think about it as only reading 0. This is called a 0 register. So instead of thinking of this as decoding to nothing, think of it as decoding for register 0, which happens to be a 0 register. Also, notice that if you write to register 0, the data doesn't get stored anywhere. It essentially just gets thrown out. That makes sense, because why would you write to it if it's just going to read 0 no matter what? Now having a 0 register might sound stupid, but we'll see later on that it's actually going to be pretty useful. But anyways, this is now a fully working register file. A register file is just a collection of registers with the ability to write to any of them or read from any of them. Specifically, this register file has four registers, 0, 1, 2, and 3, with 0 being a 0 register. If you're making your own computer and want the simplest design possible for a register file, then this is what I recommend. But this wouldn't be a video about register files without talking about one of the most common features, dual read. Dual read is the ability to read two registers at once. In hardware, there are two main strategies to do this, true dual read and simulated dual read. In true dual read, you basically just duplicate all the output wires and read each one separately. So in this example, you can see that it lets you read register 1 with one set of wires and register 2 with the other set. In simulated dual read, you instead keep two copies of the registers and then just read each copy normally. To read registers 1 and 2, for example, just read one on the first copy and two on the second. Note that since you have two copies now, this means you have to keep them in sync. One easy way to do that is to just write to both copies whenever you execute a write. So with redstone, here's an example of true dual read. There's only one copy of the registers, but the output wiring gets really messy. There are two read decoders now, so you can put in any two addresses here and read them both at once. And then here's an example of simulated dual read. Simulated dual read is actually a lot easier to make with redstone because you can basically just mirror the entire circuit to make the copy. This is the first copy of registers 1, 2, and 3, and this is the other copy. It's symmetrical. To keep them in sync, the write decoder now writes to both copies at once with this redstone line. So if you write to register 1, for example, you can see that both register 1s receive a write signal perfectly in sync. And then there are just two separate read decoders, one on each side. So you can read any register here and any register here. All right, now let's build the register file that we're actually going to use in our computer. Again, if you just want the simplest design, I recommend this. But the one we're going to use is going to be a bit fancier because it'll take advantage of some smart redstone tricks. We'll start by using this clever design for the write function. If you didn't know, you can also lock repeaters with a comparator. So what we have here are comparators with signal strength 1 locking every repeater. And when you power this glass tower, it cancels all of them from the side, which unlocks the entire register. This design is great because it can be stacked every two blocks, as long as you stagger them like this. Let's give our register file a total of 16 registers, 0 through 15, with 0 being a 0 register. Then for the read function, we're going to use another clever design. Notice that you can create a read function with just two inversions. Right now, the output is reading the input because the double inversion cancels out. But if you want to stop reading, you can just power it here, which forces it to be off. This design uses that strategy, but just in a fancier way. The first inversion is done with these comparators, and the second inversion is done with these torches. When the glass tower is powered, it forces all the torches to be off and stops reading the register. Just like how over here, powering the dust stops reading the bit. 
but when it's not powered, any comparators that are on will have a signal strength of 2, which is just barely enough to only affect one output and get inverted again. For example, right now there's a 5 in the register, but the glass tower is being powered, so it's not being read. To read it, you just unpower the glass tower, and you can see that the comparators just barely reach their outputs and read a 5. This probably seems like the most overcomplicated read function in the world, and it is, but it's all for a reason. It's all to make it too wide stackable, using the staggering technique again. So let's go ahead and add this to all 16 registers. Now let's add some decoders. Since there are 16 registers, we can address them using some 4-bit decoders. Here's the write decoder, with the write button already hooked up, and here's the read decoder. And finally, let's mirror this entire thing to make it simulated dual read. Now the write decoder is hooked up to both copies, and there are two read decoders, one on each side. And that's it. This is the final register file. 16 8-bit registers, dual read, and register 0 is a 0 register. In diagram form, the register file looks like this. R1 and R2 are the two read addresses, and these are the two outputs. W is the write address, and data is the 8-bit data you want to write. Now, remember in episode 1 when I said that sequential components will update using the clock signal? Well, the write button I've been using this whole time is what updates the register file. It literally controls when the register values change. So the write button is the clock signal. I've just been calling it a different name. The only thing we don't have from this diagram is the enable input. When enable is 1, it behaves the exact same way I showed you in Minecraft so far. But when enable is 0, you can't read from it or write to it. It's completely disabled. This will be a really useful feature later on, so let's go ahead and add this signal to the Minecraft build. The nice thing is, it's pretty simple to completely disable this. You can do it by just cancelling all three of the address inputs. This forces it to read register 0 on both read ports, which again, always outputs 0, and it forces any writes to register 0, which just get thrown away. So now when this lever is off, it's disabled, and when it's on, it's enabled. And just like that, we are completely matching the diagram. Here's R1, R2, W, data, clock, enable, and the two outputs which are on the other side. Let's go through some final examples to make this really solid. I'll put the diagram on screen too. Everything is zero right now, including the enable signal, so let's start by enabling it. Then I'll put in a 7 for data, a 1 for the write address, and press clock. This writes a 7 to register 1. On the first port, reading address 1 reads 7, and on the second port, reading address 1 also reads 7. Now let's change the data to 4, the write address to 2, and press clock. This writes a 4 to register 2. Switching the first read port to 2 will switch the first output to 4, and switching the second read port to 2 will switch the second output to 4. And then if we disable it, both outputs switch to 0. Note that the registers aren't reset or anything, it's just reading and writing is disabled. If you enable it later, you can continue where you left off. Memory is going to be an essential part of our computer. Later in this series, we'll see how upgrading the memory even further makes our computer a lot more powerful. But in the meantime, if you want to upgrade your brain's memory, then check out Brilliant, the sponsor of this video. Brilliant is the best way to learn about all things computer science and math. All of their online lessons use hands-on problem solving, which sticks to your brain much better than a lecture. By getting hands-on experience instead of memorizing, you'll become a better thinker while also gaining knowledge. On top of that, it'll help you develop a powerful learning habit. Learning a little bit with Brilliant every day is a thousand times better than mindless scrolling. You can even learn right on your phone, with fun lessons you can do whenever you have time. We'll touch on programming later in this series, but if you want to get a head start, then check out the Creative Coding course. This course will teach you all the essential coding elements and get you to really think like a programmer. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash or click the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. 